this is a thing we've been doing at Berkeley. Um, Andrew and Jens up are here from the team of Berkeley, they're two of the main, main guys that are developing this slide. Uh, so this is a talk I've been given in a few places, I've tailored it quite to this audience, but I, uh, I know you guys, it's like preaching to the choir about why you need a free and open uh, architecture. I think we've spent a bit of time, um, like our reasons for doing this might be slightly different from yours, it might help explain some of the decisions we made in the project. Um, anyway, let me just dive straight in. There's a lot of people working on this, not just me, it's just my name up here. Um, so I just want to start with a little disclaimer I have to give in this talk now. People have wanted to set us up as David and Goliath versus Arm. I don't know why they do that. Uh, but my first computer was uh, this thing. I don't know if anybody remembers this. If you see my talk before, you know what this is. I don't answer if you've seen the talk. But anybody else know what this machine is? I give you one hint. It's not a BBC Micro. Acorn. It's an atom, is it? It's an acorn atom. Yeah, so that was my first machine. And there's two reasons I bring this up. One is that I have a fun you know, affiliation with Acorn and now ARM. But also, when you bought this ARM, uh, this Acorn platform, it came with the schematics. Right? You actually had the whole network, the whole thing. Here's the 6502 over here. Here's the SRAM. You know, we couldn't actually parallel the SRAM at the same time. That was a minor design flaw of the SRAM. But you came with the schematic. You knew what you were getting, so you could play with it. Um, time has marched on, and now ARM is a you know, really great company. If they produce the IP you need and you can get through their you know, license agreement in time for your project, then you'd be pretty crazy. Uh, uh, you'd be crazy not to use ARM, right? Um, but there's a lot of projects that don't fit into the above, and some people are just crazy. Um, so <laughs> that's why you need something else. Um, but to start off, I mean, it's really important for people to realize that ISAs do not matter, right? They really are not that important in the overall performance of a system. Um, most of the performance energy is due to these other things. So, um, you know, use the right algorithm. You know, if, you, if you haven't got the right algorithm, no ISA is going to save you. Uh, application code, how you write it, the compiler. ISA has a small impact. Um, a lot of it's the microarchitecture, the core memory hierarchy, circuit design, how good your circuit design is. Uh, physical design, you put the stuff in the right place, keep the wires short. Um, and what kind of process technology you using? All those other things matter a lot, lot more than the ISA in terms of system performance. So ISAs don't matter, right? Um, except for this fact, they actually do matter, and the reason they matter is people write software. Um, and uh, it's the most important interface in a computer system is the instruction set architecture. That's what the guys build their software to. Um, and there's a massive cost measured in billions um, to bring up, you know, at least that's how much it costs companies to do this, to bring up uh, and tune all the ISA dependent parts of modern software stacks. Right, so a number of billions have come from Intel, say, do titanium. They spend billions, literally, on this kind of stuff. Um, and what's worse is you have to also port and tune all the stuff that's supposedly IS, IS independent, but actually isn't, for various reasons. Um, and, you know, so incredibly expensive to change ISAs. So the ISAs don't matter. It costs a fortune to change ISAs. So those two things are true. Why is there more than one ISA? It doesn't make any sense. So humanity is really dumb. We have multiple ISAs. We have a waste of effort, right? So there should only be one industry standard ISA. We only have one Ethernet standard, right? So why do we have more than one? I, and that's very powerful, right? And you know that's why uh, the networking stuff is so cheap. So why is there more? Why is there just one standard? Um, so the ISA should be free and open. Um, and you know the reason they're proprietary is really just historical and business reasons, right? It's not um, it's not a technical reason. Any technical reason why there shouldn't be one industry standard ISA. Um, uh, it's not an error of omission. It's not like the guys at Intel and ARM just forgot to make their ISA open. Oh, <laughs> oh sorry guys, we were planning to make it open, we just forgot to do that. Or ARM's like, you know, woke up this morning and realized we hadn't done that. Let's just go fix that. Um, no, they will actively hunt you down if you put up an ARM core um, to their spec. Same with MIPS, same with IBM, same with Intel. Um, you know, all these companies, that's, that's the policy, you know, they will go hunt you down. If you try and build a compatible implementation, even do all the work yourself, just to their spec, they'll come hunt you down. Um, so it's not an error of omission that these are not uh, free and open. Um, and nor is it because these guys actually build all the software for the system. So it's not like Oh, I buy an x86 chip, and Intel writes all the software that ever runs on an x86 system. They write a tiny fraction of all the software, some of the ISA dependent pieces. You know, they're a pretty big software company, actually, Intel, but you know, the vast majority of software is nothing ever, you know, 
seen by intellectuals, or written by other people, right? The whole ecosystem out there writes software for this ISA. So they're not the guys doing development. So that's not why you should pay them for the ISA, right? Um, and neither is because these guys are great at designing ISA. It's not like, oh, you Intel guys, I'm glad you did the x86. I would never have thought of that, right? You know, <laughs> what a wonderful ISA design that was. Right? So every time I go, I go, look at, I, you know, so occasionally I have these mad thoughts that maybe we'll go build an x86 in my group. Then I start looking at the ISA manual, and the first opcode is AAA. Right? Everyone know what AAA is? X86? It's like it just after, adjust for ASCII, after addition or something. So you've done a BCD addition, and this gets it ready to turn into ASCII characters. It's a really useful destruction every ISA should have it, obviously. So these guys, you know, clearly they're experts in designing ISAs, that's why we're paying them all this money for their ISAs. Of course, that's not true. Um, Terrible x86 ISA. YARM is actually a mess as well. ARMv7 was just horrendous. ARMv8 is terribly bloated because um, it also includes v7. Um, I don't see so, sorry? I don't think the 6502 mode switch to decimal mode is much better. Yeah, so anyway, the, the point is these guys are not great design ISAs. They're not the only people who can do it. Um, you know, so they made a mess of it. Um, <coughs> Same bullet point, really. No, those popular ISAs are not wonderful ISAs. They've actually got major flaws in them. They're really real problems looking at that. Um, another thing that people throw up as sort of FUD is that so these companies are the only ones who can verify ISA compatibility, right? The reason you get it from ARM is we verify it's ARM compatible. You're a software developer, so don't worry. Every platform is ARM compatible. Well, verifying ISA compatibility is difficult. It's a good thing to do, but it's nowhere near as hard as compatibility for all the other standards we have in our industry. So things like Wi-Fi, you know, getting interoperability over Wi-Fi, that's a much harder problem than verifying ISA compatibility. Industry seems to have figured it out how to do it. Right? So verifying ISA compatibility is no reason it should be proprietary for this reason. Right? So you know, that's clearly easy to do outside of the, the proprietary framework. Right? And the big one that's bugged me a long time is the ISAs go away. So um, I've been building you know, experimental computers for a long time now, like 27 years, I think it just worked out. I've been building experimental machines, and you know, I've seen a lot of very popular ISAs come and go. Right? And the problem is when they go, you can't keep using them, because what usually happens is they end up in some small IP holding company of unknown motivation, and you don't want to deal with them. Like some recent examples, relatively recent, like Digital Equipment Corporation, they were one of the biggest computer companies. They have this I say you may have heard of called Vax. There's also this other one called Alpha. A lot of research groups out in the US at least put a lot of infrastructure around the deck Alpha ISA and it's gone, right? So you just can't, you know, and you can't do anything with it anymore because somebody owns the IP for that ISA. So all the software you develop for ISA, you like washed away, right? That ISA is gone now, right? So you have to move to something else. Um, Intel x86 is not going to be around forever. It's been around for a long time. That will go away. Same with ARM. That will also go away. I guarantee that. I don't know when, maybe another 50, 60 years, but it will go away. Or it will change dramatically. Another recent example, Imagination bought MIPS. They are like changing it dramatically. Like R6, if you've read the Imagination R6 release, you know, they got rid of branch delay slots, and partly. They did a lot, bunch of stuff that happens to match with Digiverse 5. They're trying to modernize the ISA. So it's a different ISA. So the, one, the old one's kind of gone away because it's been replaced by this new one to act up. And who gets to have a say in that? Well, the people that MIPS. Or edge imagination of designing that the community doesn't really have much input on that, right? So these ISAs are in control as people, they do random things to them, including going out of business, and so you can't use them anymore, right? So that's a big problem. Um, so if you had a freely open ISA, some of the benefits from our perspective, uh, there'd be this great innovation from free market competition. So I really believe in this being an industry standard interface is the most important part of the story. And I, you know, so RISC-5 is not an open source processor project. RISC-5 is a open ISA specification. At Berkeley, we are also happening to be developing open source processor cores that match that spec. But I would be equally happy if companies did proprietary RISC-V implementations, if people did GPL implementations, people did BSD. I don't really care what license you have, but the spec interface should be open. Right? That's, that's the uh, most important thing to us. But once you have that spec, it enables this competition. Like Anybody can compete on the implementation quality. One interesting thing about ARM is all the best ARM processors are not designed by ARM, they're designed by other people, the architectural licensees. So, you know, Apple Cyclone is in the iPhone, 
A series processors or you know the uh, Qualcomm Snapdragon. Those are the high-end uh, processors, not designed by ARM. Right. So those same design teams, you know, they could go build any ISA and make it pretty fast. So you have those guys competing over the quality implementation. You also have the open source community doing their own core, sharing a core design. I think what's interesting, this thing about you know, lots of people can look at the same design and all work on improving it, you know, best of all the ideas, you can actually try them out and see what actually works as an academic doing research. It would be wonderful that people actually try to do that architecture research ideas and the real processor implementation that ran lots of real software. And then you would see that most of the ideas are completely you know, useless, that right? don't actually help at all. But that would be a great advancement for architecture research. Another big deal is um, working with government agencies, they, are, they don't want to buy, especially foreign governments, don't want to buy stuff from ARM or Intel because they don't trust them anymore. They don't believe that uh, there's not some NSA you know, backdoor that's been injected by RTL or something else. Um, so uh, a lot of foreign governments are wary about using you know, pre-canned IP from the companies. On the other hand, if you, you, know, uh, you have to design your own ISA, there's a lot of work to do in getting everything up and running. right? So. Uh, that's a reason why it'd be nice to have a standard interface anybody can use. Um, I don't think actually license costs are a big deal. I mean, for most people who actually finish the negotiations with ARM, the actual cost of the core is not that great. But there is an upfront cost and there's a time to market issue. Um, but for some things, you do want to be extremely cheap. And so licensing the core is, is an issue. Maybe they'll be talking about a few cents as a, as your profit margin. So um, you know, pretty cheap cores would make, or free cores would help people with this. Uh, and then research and education is actually why we started doing this. I wanted, you know, I got fed up of hacking up all these different ISAs in my projects. I just wanted a clean slate one we could use in all of our projects. I could give away RTL to everybody else. Uh, and that's why we wanted to do it. Um, and also have everything be stay put when all these companies come and go. Right? I thought it was really funny one time I went to ARM and gave a talk there and realized their research group was smaller than my research group. Right? They're a small company, you know, good luck to them, but I don't know if they're really survive. This industry is pretty brutal. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of other, we're not the first guys I think are doing an open ISA. There's a bunch of other ones being out there. Um, so Sun, to their credit, you know, made Spark V8 and IEEE standards. That was, you know, here is the standard. Anybody can implement it. I think they did have a $99 fee to become a licensee, but that's a very low barrier to entry. But it became an official standard. Problem is now, you know, they've been bought by Oracle, you know, and it's like Larry's machine. So you, you know, Larry does what he wants with it. You can't play in that space. Um, but it's old enough to be patent free. Ah, no. So the, the point is, V8 is still free. You can still do V8. There's nobody questions that. The problem is, I want 64-bit Spark. Now it's not clear. It's they. It's incumbent. We'll get to patents in a minute, actually. So there's patents that are, that are visible at the ISA level. But the most worrying thing about patents is not those, but the microarchitecture patents, right? So I don't think actually ISA level patents are a huge, you can avoid them easily, because most of us do it, right? They, they usually patent things you would never want to do in an ISA, you just have to have it. We call them ISA quirks. So people patent ISA quirks because all the sensible things were done far too long ago, but people were able to patent them. And so they patent these weird things they have. Microarchitecture patents are much more difficult to get around, but a lot of the ideas were more than 20 years ago. So, so just to be clear on the Spark V8 thing, you, you're talking about later Spark yes. implementation, yes. not necessarily So V8, V8 is fine. The same with ARM. ARM to V5 is also fine. It's not covered by patents. You can do an ARM V5 core. It's just after that it will come out to you. Right. So, there's, so V8 is free, it's open, you can actually implement that. So I say it doesn't matter as long as it has the right address list. Right, which is, I'll get to that as well, why address space is important. Right, you need a big enough address space. But which one of that address width doesn't matter too much? Um, so there's open risk. I think you guys know about this. Um, uh, I didn't realize until uh, this weekend that it was actually based on the LX. I thought they'll date that, but we were excited. I guess we didn't even know that. I guess we didn't look carefully enough. Um, uh, then this is relatively new, and we just found out about that hot chips, actually, that uh, Shunpei Kawasaki, who is one of the lead designers of Super H in Japan, um, he has this mission to make Super H open because Hitachi's lost interest in it, it's not very popular, and most of the patents that are related to that ISA are actually expiring. So he's actually trying to um, bring this out as a, another available open source group. Uh, so they, they actually work called the Open Core Foundation, 
but after discussion, he said, yes, it would be a good idea to change the name. So now it's called the Open Processor Foundation. That would open for, right? I guess I also, uh, the LM32 is something I just found out recently as well. I could put that to the list. There's probably a few more on here. So we're not the first people to do this, but we like RISC V, obviously, because um, when we survey the scene, um, Chris, one you've missed out, which I think is the other the one that everyone comes up second after everyone, is Leon. Yeah. Well, that's... that's, 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 that's oh, you're putting under Spike. Yeah, 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 sorry, I should actually add Leon. Yeah, yeah, under okay. There. Under there, right. Yeah. Well, it's a bit sliced processor, you can just have it 64 bit wide. Say again, sorry. It's a bit sliced processor. Well, the AMD 2900 series parts, yeah, you can build your own. There's a lot of people doing... When I go into this stuff, a lot of mini computers are being built by people using those AMD bit slices to do their own little, you know, boards of stuff. Yeah, those. Yeah, I remember working in the department had like nine different mini computers. They're all different ISAs. <laughs> Just like crazy. Anyway, um, so some of the background to this. We started this in 2010. So, like I said, I've been doing lots of research projects over the years, and I finally got fed up. And well, what happens is every time I get through a phase, a new batch of grad students, we need a new set of projects. We sort of look around what ISA should we use for this next set of projects. Right, so around 2010, this happened again. Um, and the obvious choices were x86 or ARM. These are the, you know, everything runs on these guys, or most stuff runs on either one of them. Um, so looking at it, you know, it's clear that x86 is impossible. It's just too complex, and there's these IP issues, right? So you look at ARM, you know, to paraphrase Douglas Adams, it's mostly impossible, right? So it's also very complicated and there's all the IP issues, right? So neither of these would really work. Um, so we started this three-month project, uh, summer 2010, to just do a clean slate ISA that we would use uh, internally for our purposes, right? So we looked at open risk, but there was a bunch of technical problems with it at that time. Um, also, this was actually prior to ARMv8 coming out. Uh, it was something we, may have, we knew it was happening, but we didn't know the details, right? So that was a, sort of in the back of our head was an ARM, uh, Sparks, ARM's gonna release this 64-bit uh, thing that might be cleaner and, usable, but it wasn't out when we started this project. So this is a three-month project. Um, about four years later, um, we sort of finished it, right? And we released this um, frozen uh, user spec uh, earlier this year, um, and that's why we started pushing this out there uh, more aggressively to the community. Some of the people found out about it and sent drafts out to people, but we hadn't really felt ready to you know, push it on the world. Um, but along the way, it's not like we just sat down and wrote the spec for four years. We've done many actual silicon implementations, and lots of research publications have used those uh, designs in, in, in between. Uh, but you know, after a lot of work, we feel this is iterated long enough and we've got to the point of getting the user level spec out there. Right? Um, so what is it? Um, so we thought about the design is pretty hard and some of our uh, objectives are to really support uh, very small implementations, very big implementations, basically one ISA for everything. We don't see a need to have different ISAs for different market segments. No reason, no technical reason for that beyond changing the address width. Um, one thing we uh, wanted to do is make it very easy to extend it. You know, there's a lot of interest in accelerators and specialized core processors. We want to make it very easy to do that. Um, we also uh, uh, wanted to support something that would last a very long time uh, while having many, many different variants of instruction sets. So managing extensibility is one of the goals of the ISA design. Um, I'll go into a little bit of how we do that. But just to get started, so there's three base integer ISAs, one per address width. So RV32i, RV64i, and RV128i. So there's a 32-bit, 64-bit, 128-bit address space variants, right? Uh, the i just means this is the integer base. So those only, to implement those, you only need to implement 40 hardware instructions. And that was designed to be, um, all those instructions were kind of so necessary that nobody would subset an implementation by leaving them out. Right. That was one of the goals. Um, also, this was enough to run a modern software stack. So you should be able to, you know, compilers, operating systems, dynamic linking, pick code, supported by this base integer instruction set. So if you want to do some kind of custom accelerator, you would start with this, and you could ignore everything else we've got and just do your own stuff on the side, but you would have a working C compiler, Unix, or everything else you could start from in building that new widget. So if you want to just take that little core base and go off completely by yourself, you can and have full toolchain support. And with only 40 hardware instructions, right? That was the design goal. Chris, so, Chris, I don't know if you want to take questions on route. Sure, or, yeah, it's yeah, better on route. Why 32 is the smallest? Because if you look at the size of our smallest core, and you look at like four kilobytes of SRAM, 
It's like, well, you know, I could build a smaller microcontroller. It's not going to change the cost of my system at all, and it's going to add a lot of headaches in my compiler tool chain. You know, 32-bit, like, it, it causes a tiny, so they really don't, going below 32-bit. I, I'm yeah. wondering why 32-bit is even included, considering there are already viable choices for 32-bit. It's a 8 and 16-bit legacy. They're not viable for us. So, you know, so they're not viable for the reasons we gave. Right? Um, so how much are the encoding space is reserved for extensions? Well, I'll get into that. Yeah, we, we'll get into that. So, but just to start out, is why do we have 128? Surprising that's that. So we put that initially as a joke because the one mistake you can make that I say is not having enough address space. That's really hard to recover from. It's a classic book. Um, and when we started, it was a bit of a joke. We thought this is kind of funny. And it turned out it was very easy enough. Instruction template to include it. Um, but having gone around and talked to a lot of people in the industry, um, there's already um, you know, data center clusters that have 10 petabyte in memory databases in production use. So 10 petabytes is um, you know, 54 bits of address space for solid state memory in those production clusters. They're not directly load store addressable, but that, that's probably going to change. It will work on new interconnects, um, uh, direct user access to uh, things like RDMA. So people are seeing a need, probably in the next decade, we're going to exceed 64 bits of addressable solid state memory in a data center cluster. Right? So we saw this as a kind of a joke, but actually there's some interest in that, that, that design point. It's already there in the ISA. So there are these standard extensions. Um, uh, so you know, <coughs> MAFD, we sort of give them letters for the extensions. So M is integer multiplied divides, that's not part of the debate. That's only a few instructions. There's atomics, uh, single precision, double precision, floating point. So these five together, sort of base I, M, A, F, D, we have the shorthand we call those G, and that's kind of our general purpose ISA. So that's like you know, most software, that's all we need to use. And um, you know, but currently this is the thing we use most of the time. The Linux port and everything else uh, uses this G um, implementation. The quads are already defined. A few other extensions are already defined. Uh, but the idea is this G subset that's going to be fixed. So we're not going to change that. That's it. That's kind of done. You know, no version two of that. That's it. This is version two. There's no further version for all time that I say will exist. And I believe that's actually fine for most applications. There's no need to. Can I just make a comment? With, with Open Risk, we have the headache of the kind of base instruction set, the 32-bit instruction set being quite big. And all the time, we thought, you know, we have a soft core, so hey, let's leave an instruction now, or, or two, right? Because it'll save, I don't know, three LUTs or something. And, uh, <laughs> and then we have the issue with the tool chain. Oh, you know, if we leave out a couple of instructions, we need to build a different tool chain. Um, now we're at the point where we do have sort of certain sets of the instruction set which do get used, which don't include the entire integer base set, and you know we're not sure what to do with it. It is a bit of a sticking point, right? Like you know the class one, two, and three instructions that are with open risk. Yeah, I mean that that's been a real problem in the past years. Is the multi you can multi lib explosion you get in the compiler, yeah. and I was discussing a little earlier, but the um, maybe. If you actually say, yeah, I've got all these extensions, but there's actually only two or three that are ever used, you're okay. But, uh. Well, I actually think, you know, the, the, so the I thing, you'll never, no hard developer would want to subset that. You'd be, you'd be dumb, right? And frankly, you'd be dumb to leave any of those out. Yeah, that's fine. Um, and that alone will support that with the compiler tool chains, right? You know, adding M and A, M, you know, if you want to do multiply divide, maybe go A, if you're going to do anything multiprocessor, you're going to need this. Um, uh, but G, I think, is the, you know, just writing a general call, that's what you're going to have. Um, and I don't think, if, if you need any of these facilities it, within those, there are, one thing we did set no a lot in the instructions, it's pretty lean in what's in there. Um, Why is that? But the, but the problem, but the, uh, the, I'm not arguing against the sets you've got, I'm just saying, if you say, well, you could, you, you know, someone, I don't want double, I'm, I don't need any floating points, so I just do I, M, A, and F. If I'm going to use that efficiently, I'm going to have to have a version of all my libraries yep. that don't generate the floating point things. And I have to have that separately because otherwise then someone comes along with dedicated floating point and I haven't got a version of the library that does use it. Right. And it, it's two to the N for the number of common units. Right. Yeah. So, I think there's only a few profiles that well, some of commonly used. Yeah, okay. Right. But if, do you guys have a floating point in your current implementations? 
yeah. double precision one. Yeah. So that's the G, it's G supported hardware I'm currently calling that. Yeah. Why, why the reason it was splitting up the A stuff? Is that Yeah, that was because a lot of people are interested in accelerators where they don't there's one core that communicates with the rest of the world through, for example, FIFOs in hardware. There's no other core, there's no reason to have the A in that core, and more people would leave it out. So um, and array operations are reasonably extensive. Um, on it. So uh, but there, there is this model of if you want to build a multi-computer on a chip as opposed to a multi-processor, like the um, uh, Stefan's uh, talk, right? They distribute everything, which core locally is a you know single processor core, right? As I understand it, with DMA out, and you don't need DA. Now you just disable it, so you you know you don't need atomics with some simple single core units on a chip. Why is what? Why is multiply divide tied together? Multiply usually gives you much more bang for the back. Um, you know, at some point you do have to deal with how many of these things you have. And usually, you know, they are reciprocal operations, you know, if you, you can say I just want to multiply, I don't want to divide. But divide is really cheap to do, actually, if you don't care how fast it is. You know, but, and also, if you're always free, the implementation can always trap them anyway. If you need multi-cycle operations just for the divide, isn't that expensive? No, we're talking about a few gates, it's like nothing. Really nothing. You know, if you have a cache, you have multi-cycle operations that misses. But there's nothing, yeah, that's, that's just cheap. So one thing as well, the encoding was designed to be very small, like we have this weird scrambled immediate format. It was designed to save muxes in FPGAs. You find this as very, very tiny implementation as possible. So one thing about this, I say, I think to remember is with a common problem I saw in looking at open source ISAs is they have this 1940s, 1950s mentality about they design the core and the ISA around the core. They're thinking about cycles for this, cycles for that, for this one implementation style they have in mind. We want to use a much more advanced, like 10 years on, 1960s style computer architecture design where you separate the ISA from implementations. And um, there was, I, I actually, I'll talk a bit more about our privilege state, we'll be doing that even more than current machines do. But it's really is important not to worry about like this multiply divide thing. You can trap and anything in this instruction set, and we you know we can support that very well as well. So if you want to leave out the hard divider, you can. Right? Just trap and emulate. Right? But but we don't want to then subdivide. The software doesn't have to deal with that difference. Right? Um, one thing we have thought about along those lines is providing for compatibility. So it turns out that we can patch a binary. Like the simplest thing you can do is when I hit an unimplemented instruction, something I don't know about, maybe because I'm an older processor and somebody's added a new extension, you just trap it anyway. But what we have is a way of patching the binary within that one instruction's footprint with a call to a subroutine that emulates. So you only have to trap the first time, and after that it becomes a subroutine call. And we figured out how to do that without changing the binary image. So we can go in and patch a call to an emulation routine uh, in place. Um, so you can actually on the fly patching the emulation code to become a user level call to a library as opposed to a trap into the OS. That's actually architected in. Um, so this these are what you know so the, the base ISA is the integer set and we have these um, very standard extensions. Um, all of these ones uh, fit into a sta fairly standard risk encoding in a fixed 32 bit instruction format. Right? So if you're just implementing these you just have standard fixed 32 bit instructions, classic risk. Um, Okay, so the, the base ISA format is a pretty vanilla risk uh, encoding. Um, so, um, and we made this extremely simple. In particular, the destination register is always in the same place as are the two sources. We flip a few media bits around uh, to enable that. Um, yeah, so very simple, classic risk style encoding for the base set. Um, so there's, you know, 32 integer registers, the X0 registers are wired. There's 32 floating point registers that hold any width. Each register holds any width of floating point, uh, plus the floating point uh, status register. Uh, we support IEEE 2008, so there's few small ads, and that the, the floating point will then add a four operand uh, format that didn't show up here. Um, you know, everything's designed as well picked and I'm linking quite well. Um, so that's the base ISA. So if you're just implementing this, it's pretty vanilla risk design and actually very, very simple. Uh, encode uh, process. Was, was there any need to 
actually have an ISA that actually specifies it's encoding? Can you not separate out an ISA from its encoding? You need a hard ISA. This is often an access. It shouldn't always be virtual machines. Well, it can't be terminals all the way down. Somebody has to design a hardware and you need a hardware ISA, and that's what we're designing. So you, and well, actually, it's a design decision that you're going to make the cut there. Well, you have, it doesn't matter where you make a cut. At some point, you have to build hardware that interprets instructions. So you need a spec for that. Our idea is actually the virtual machine should also be RISC-V. That's a, that's a much okay. longer talk, separate talk. So the hardware I say is what we're talking about here. One of our goals was something for real implementations, that's what we were building. Um, and somebody has to define native hardware spec. And if you don't, you go back to the, the first few slides about why do ISAs matter, is because porting and tuning all the ISA dependent pieces takes forever. So you might wonder, why doesn't ARM have a competitive JVM? Right, they don't, right? Because it costs a lot of time and money to build a competitive JVM. So, okay, which is really leading on to the second question is, surely this is pretty, you're going to have big programs. It's not going to be very attractive to the embedded world, because you haven't got a 16-bit representation. Yes, we do, so I'll get to that. Oh, right, okay, sorry, okay. <laughs> All right, so before I move on there, I'll just take a little, say a little about the atomic extensions, because they're part of our base G set. So, uh, atomics, we had a lot of, this, this is one of the pieces that took a lot of discussion. One of the things that changed a lot over the course of the time. There's basically two classes of atomic. We have AMOs, which are fetch and off. So add or XOR, max min. So these are you know guaranteed um, on a single word, you do an atomic fetch and off on that word. You get the old value and you write back the atomically updated value. Um, then we also have load reserves or conditional with a forward progress guarantee for a certain uh, length of sequence in there. Right, so that's our uh, atomic support. You can actually, in a microarchitecture's design, the AMOs can be implemented on top of this support, if that's what you want to do, or you can do it more directly in the hardware. Um, now, one thing we've added here, um, finally the language community seems to have got their memory model story straight. Um, so we actually provided um, two bits on each of these atomic instructions, uh, indicating acquire and release orderings on those operations. And so these directly support the you know, UC atomic standards, Java memory model, um, so we can implement at least consistency, or if you set both bits, it's strongly consistent. All right, so these are added to those AMOs, so by using those AMOs, you can do loads and stores uh, according to the, the specs of the atomic libraries in those languages. Um, so this is something we added along, along the way. There's also on the load reserve store conditional, so you can add new primitives that obey those uh, memory model semantics as well. So that's our atomic extensions. Um, Variable length encoding. So to get to this next point, so from the start, we designed this to support uh, variable length instructions. And the reason was we wanted a very extensible ISA, some of the accelerator extensions, you want very long instructions. Um, also for compressed, uh, compressing code, to lower the code size, you want compressed instructions. So our fixed 32-bit format is what we use in the base, but everything that's in the base has a low 2-bit set for 1. Right, so the 32 instructions are low two bits of the uh, instruction word is set to one. If they are you know, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, those are 16 bit instructions. Right, so those just mix in. When you add, I'll describe the next slide, when we add our compressed extensions, they just mix in with the regular base instructions you had already. Right, it's not like Thumb 2, which did this really dumb thing of having a second 32 bit ISA with 16 bit that's separate from the 32 bit when you're not using the compressed format here. There's a single 32-bit ISA, and as an extension, you might compress instructions. They just slot in uh, the encoding space. Right. Also, we support longer encodings, and in fact, arbitrarily long uh, instruction length encoding. They did the scapegoat technique to get you out to longer uh, instruction encoding. So you can tell both from the first, you can tell the instruction length from the first few bits of the first. So everything's in units of 16-bit parcels. Um, and you can tell the length, most of the length from the first parcel you hit in the instruction fetch unit as you're fetching through these things. Right? So it's pretty easy to build a instruction fetch unit to handle these variable length instructions. Um, so one thing to support this, one way this shows up in the base ISA is that all the uh, jumps branches in the base ISA go to 16-bit boundaries, even though the instructions are 32-bit aligned. That's to allow uh, us to add in these variable lengths later. Right? So you get a one-bit reduction in range in the base ISA. It's not a huge deal. Uh, we'll just live with that. Uh, doesn't seem to matter. But you get this big benefit of being able to mix in this compressed, compressed instruction extension. So, um, so compressed code is important in two places. One is the low-end embedded systems where you worry about static code size. The other is in high-end commercial workloads 
Are you worried about construction footprint? You know, some commercial uh, binaries are up in the hundreds of megabytes range, and the construction working sets are in the 80 <coughs> megabyte range. Um, so you kind of need, you know, compressing code is important there for performance as well as energy efficiency. Um, so we have several versions of this that we've gone through. We have a draft uh, we'll be putting out soon. If you want to read an earlier version, Andrew's master's thesis was about uh, the first version of this compressed instruction extension. Um, we've been working on it since then. You know, some of the basic ideas we do there are uh, a lot of instructions are just encoded as three address, but you can get by two address, and the source and destination are the same. That's pretty common. Or, and so those two address forms can access all 32 registers. There's also some three address forms that can only access a subset eight of the registers, uh, the most frequently used registers, right? Um, so each one of these C instructions will just expand out to a 32-bit base instruction. Um, so it's really easy to add to the pipeline. Um, um, and it's about a 25% reduction in code size. Now our code size is already pretty good for a risk, um, primarily because we have the parent branch, the single instruction, I would say. That's one of the reasons we have dense code. Um, so after we add this C thing, we're probably about a few percent bigger than Thumb2. Um, we're still working through actual proper comparisons uh, with thumb, and, uh, thumb 2 size code base, but we're a few percent bigger primarily because we don't have load multiple store multiple, uh, which is a good way of reducing code size, but adds a bunch of complexity we didn't want to chew off. Um, so I think our code size is actually very competitive once we add this uh, C extension in. Um, but do you have those branch delays? We don't have any branch delays. Uh, don't know of any macro architecture that doesn't have any branch delays, it's just how you handle that. Well, if you say branch delays, I'm assuming you meant ISA visible, as opposed to control hazards in the micro architecture. Right. So control hazards, we have very extensive branch relation structures. Um, that's, that's, an that's an implementation detail. That's an implementation detail, yeah. You can do it or not. You can have a very simple one, a very complex yeah, one. It's... Have, you, yeah. have you had a look at the information content of your instruction stream? One of the intriguing things was the transputer, which was nibble encoded. Because if you look at That's general instruction stream, you know, I'm not recommending you go there. But one of the things that came out of that was the fact that if you look at instruction streams, there's about four bits per operation. And, I want, and one of the problems with a lot of instruction sets, they don't get close to that. Yeah, I think that's really, um, I'd say those measures are a bit bogus because the entropy depends on the quality of the code. If you're doing a highly optimized kernel, you can use many more registers than you would in a triply optimized kernel. So, um, yeah. I, yeah, I know the transmitter very well. I wrote operating systems for the transmitter before they had C components. I, so I wasn't. I wasn't really. I wasn't really. Rec I, was, I wasn't really recommending yes. you went down that route. I'm just yeah. intrigued as to but how close you think you're getting to the information oh, no, content of the instruction. Yeah, I think this is hardware. Uh, very simple hardware code style. If you want to do better compression, you can look at uh, lots of people doing different things, including you can compress in memory and you can compress in cache refills, um, decompressing on the fly out of the cache. Uh, is really slow and energy intensive probably. There's a whole bunch of literature. You could probably get another factor of two, I think, not without working too hard. Um, but that's going to have other penalties. With this, um, there's strictly only a performance improvement uh, from doing this. You never get a performance decrease by adding compressed instructions. Because you can always use a 32-bit one in the baseline. You just get the choice of using the shorter one, but you use the shorter one, you get a smaller iCache footprint, uh, less uh, iCache misses, you get better performance. So it only is a positive thing in terms of performance. I'm interested in why you chose 32 registers. What convinced you to do that? 32, yeah. The reason we chose 32 registers, very simple. 16-bit, if we picked a 16-bit fixed instruction format, that's too small uh, to encode three address with 16 registers. Okay, no, backing off. You need at least 16 registers to run general integer code. Right, eight's not enough. 16's kind of needed to occur. If you go above that, helps a bit, not a lot. So you could argue you surely have 16 integer registers. Great. 60-bit fixed instruction format, you can't fit a three-address format in there with 16 registers. Okay, two-address format, you suck your performance, right? You do lots of unnecessary moves. So, you need 32-bit instruction format. You have a 32-bit instruction format, you can easily fit 32 registers. It helps even general twisty C code, but it also helps high-performance code. We have accelerators and we have as pointers and you do tiling and blocking, you often run out of integer registers. So, people who just look at Compile C code and not high performance code, think the 16 is enough. If you, you know, auto tune and generate very high performance kernel code, you run out of integer registers. So that's why I went to 32. That's the minor reason. 
the uh, variable length instruction code is neat for code density, but uh, isn't it a bit hard on the instruction decoder when you try to look ahead and look at where your next branch is and where your dependencies are? Yeah, it's, it, it's more difficult. It's, you know, the highest performance machines in the world to deal with it. So it's obviously some complexity, but it doesn't hurt performance. Right. You remember that you've got a trade off. If I have more, the point is I'm not just building the simplest possible core and going home. I have a design budget. How much effort am I going to expend? How much performance am I going to get out of that? And I would argue that the variable length instructions are actually a great way of getting more performance compared to doing something else in the equivalent performance game. Well, uh, there are different ways to do variable lengths. Uh, uh, another way is to go with the multi-pack thing. So you can have two small instructions in one 32-bit container, which has the advantage that you can look at 32 bit ahead to your next instruction. Well, the reason we encode the bits at the first thing is you know exactly where the next one starts. You don't have to do any. There's no, you don't have to scan the opera. There's two bits that tell you where the next guy is. So you, you know, there's no. That's really easy to find the next head of the next instruction. Right. So it's, it, it's very cheap, very black and code. And also doing the thing of packing it in two, having them not straddle 32 bit boundaries. But packing two into one, that was the, the original MIPS design of Stanford. Did that. It doesn't need to use great code density. So. Okay, um, so that's the user level ISA. One other thing we did in the ISA to talk about is to cleanly separate user level ISA from details of the supervisor and details of the microarchitecture. You know, along the way, I read many other ISA manuals and reread many ISA manuals. And it's amazing how they mix all these things together in the ISI, the ISA spec. Uh, and it's also amazing once people read our ISA spec, they kept asking us stuff they shouldn't be asking us. Like, you know, if you're asking that, you just that's the wrong question to be asking. So details of the supervisor, the cache line size, cache management instructions, those have no place in a user level ISA. Right? Or they shouldn't have, right? Because um, this is supposed to be long lived many implementations. It's that 1940s, 50s thinking about computer architecture. So, Anyway, so this is just user ISA. Now I'll move to the privileged ISA. Now we view that happening. So this is something that's still in progress. We should be putting out a draft pretty soon. Um, so this doesn't match what we currently do in our current implementations. We have a much simpler, oh, we have a, it's pretty close, but not quite the same as what we do in our current implementations. To tell you about our thinking, uh, we want to provide a very clean split between layers of the privileged software stack. So, and as some terminology here, I'll, I'll go through. So when you run an application, you don't just have the instructions, the ISA, you also have you know, calls that can make out the environment as an API. Right? So you write an application to an API, not just to an ISA. Right? So that API encodes like the syscalls you can do on a Unix kind of system. Um, and you can think of that application running on what we call an application execution environment. Right? So we talked earlier on about, say, QMU has its mode, but you just run the app on top of something that translates it to the, the host machine's native OS environment. Right? So that would be you know, we'll do that, this AE will be that thing there. So the application is coded to an ABI, it doesn't care how the ABI is implemented in terms of functionality, we'll get the correct results, we should get the correct results in any valid implementation of the AE, right? Similarly, um, when you build an OS, well, an OS is an example of this, and it exports the ABI to applications, lets them run to that ABI. You know, look at multi program multiple of those on some platform. But what we're insisting on in RIS 5 is now the OS doesn't get to call the hardware directly. So all these issues you were talking about in the multiprocessor, um, uh, Stefan's multiprocessor project, you know, those are not, the OS should not have to deal with that, right? And our goal is to have a single image, binary image of the OS should run on any hardware platform. And we do that by providing what we call a supervisor binary interface, which is the thing the OS talks to to get at the hardware platform. So reset doesn't go to the OS, reset goes to supervisor execution environment, it'll set everything up. The OS just gets entered at some defined entry point and gets told where the hardware cores are and things like that. There's a, there's a path out to interrogate to find the devices in that system, um, but the idea is that the OS doesn't really uh, see most of the, the platform differences. We want to insulate it through this SPI. Um, another thing is the OS doesn't control devices. It just does I.O. with devices. So if you're familiar with Linux for I.O., something like that is what we're planning to do. So no device drivers inside the OS makes the supervisor binary interface very simple. Um, and actually can result in a lot of high performance because these days people are putting cores out by the old devices because cores are tiny compared to the old devices. You can offload a lot of the 
you, know, you can do a whole block transfer when having the I/O device do all the breaking it up into Ethernet frames and things like that for you. Right? So, so the OS is coming to an SDI, it's implemented by some supervisor execution environment. Now, one example of that might be you put a hypervisor in. You put a hypervisor in, it exports the SBI to multiple guest OSs. And, but we don't let the hypervisor touch the hardware either. Right? Hypervisor has hypervisor binary in place. So the same hypervisor should run any system. Right? So it is turtles all the way down, kind of. Right? We keep doing this. And the point is each layer should only see ISA instructions, privileged ISA instructions, and the system calls that are necessary for it to do its piece of the job, and not all the other junk in the system. And the idea is to support a wide diversity of implementations, everything from test chip setups to simulation environments to actual chips on different kinds of platforms. We want to minimize the different, you know, just minimize the software management overhead of having all those different things by breaking the functionality up this way. Yeah. Okay, so hypervisor talks to the HBI to a hypervisor execution environment. And we designed the ISA to support, you know, traditional classic virtualization. So you can run the guest OS at user level and instructions that are privileged are easy to detect in the hardware and you just track down to the uh, supervisor model to do those. So it's really easy to do classic uh, um, you know, IBM style uh, virtualization. Um, so, but when you are building a hardware platform, you need to have the hardware platform talk to the execution environment and tell it what to do. So basically have a how that sits above the hardware and talks to the relevant uh, execution environment, right? So although I've drawn up all these layers, you might think all those layers, you're going to do all this performance, you know, calls pinging around between all these layers. But even the hardware platform is not something that sits out in the periphery of a bus somewhere. It's included in the processor core, so the facilities that handle trap vectoring, whatever, are actually part of the hardware core. And you go directly to the right place when a certain event happens. The right place meaning which privilege level and which piece of trap handling code to do that. And that's supported in the hardware platform. Right? So the notion is, provide an environment where you can modulize your software in this nice way, you're not giving up anything performance, you're probably gaining your performance by doing this. Um, uh, but yeah, so you can see all these layers, but in fact, you know, most of the time you're not traversing through all these different layers. Of it. The stack yeah, at, at runtime. Okay, so running like, initially, I go this all this work. We think of you know new kinds of OS and whatever. But for now, we're trying to find something that runs the classic popular OSs that people want to run, get stuff done. And so we define four uh, uh, supervisor uh, ISAs, uh, what we call S bear. So S is for supervisor. So S bear is bare metal, no translation of protection. This is kind of like a reptilian brain. You know, the thing comes up in S bear. You can then switch to base and bounds, is another model where you just have you know, crate style base and bounds protection on a data segment. Um, then we have SV32 and SV43, so these are 32 bit uh, virtual, uh, virtual memory system for you know, running our 32 bit machine. And then SV43, we provide 43 bit virtual address spaces on a 64 bit uh, class machine. And these are just really designed, very simple, uh, very vanilla designs just to support current popular operating systems. Okay. Um, a few other things I'll throw in here just because um, I was thinking about them when uh, Stefan was talking. So interprocessor interrupts. Um, so our OS, um, the only interrupts our OS level sees are a timer interrupt, a real-time timer interrupt, and a uh, software interrupt. A software interrupt comes from a send IPI call. So it's a send IPI instruction, sorry. Send IPI instruction sends an interrupt from one uh, hardware thread to another hardware thread. Right, so there's only two interrupts that our OS can see. And the soft interrupt is also used for when devices are communicating with that, uh, with that OS image. It's so only two interrupts in your OS. It's like pretty, uh, so, so, what, what, how, so what, what, what happens when you get your um, new divide instruction you haven't implemented? How? So, we want the OS not to see that. So that's going to happen under a fraction. Oh, right, okay, that's the whole point there. Okay, good. Yeah, right. The idea is that we're still figuring this out, but we want to have things like misaligned loads and stores, which are actually supported. Allow you to misfire those of stores. Um, and uh, missing instruction, emulation, uh, various other things. The OS won't even see those. We don't even know if those aren't there. Uh, uh, how is it DMA buffer underrun handled? DMA buffer underrun. So, so we'd like to put um, IO up in. Uh, you'd like to, in most cases, to copy directly into the user space that receives data. And you protect the user side by using the user page tables. And you'd like to protect the DMA side where it's getting from in the system by a separate facility that protects that piece of the physical space from uh, the DMA engine. 
So when you have a process that produces a large stream of data set it and it sends it out via an interface, then the process will block at some point when the buffer fills up right. and needs to unblock when the buffer uh, gets drenched. Right. So how is this event communicated? That's the SPI. Uh, that, in the me mechanics of that would be the send IPI. Would, like look at that IO, you get notified when things are done as well as when things are... Um, yeah, so you get notified when the buffers are drained and you have you can then allocate new stuff onto the same buffer. So this notifies, is it not an interrupt? Yes, it is an interrupt. The mechanism underneath the hood is an interrupt and the user sees a callback uh, to add stuff. The kernel sees a callback to add stuff. So all this is also designed, if you only have a single core, this should all, all, also will also still work. Right? You may have many cores, and you may have cores dedicated to I.O. Uh, this architecture. But it will work if you have only a single core, you're time multiplexing across these functions. Okay. Um, so where we are with all this, I'm kind of moving to kind of status. That's kind of, so this privilege spec we should put out in a few weeks. We're still like um, getting to a point where it's readable by others. Um, so, use that spec you can go see you know, for a while. Um, I recommend reading this and all the rationale. Like all the questions here, we actually wrote them down why we did things the way we did in the document itself. You can go read our reasonings. Um, software tools, we have GCC, um, standard GNU toolchain, LVM, client Linux, uh, verification suite, uh, implementations on FPGAs. Uh, I'll talk about Chisel in a minute. Um, software implementations, we have a version that runs with JavaScript. It's not a fast, as fast as a, what we heard about, so I'm excited to get our undergrad to mm -hmm. steal all your own good ideas. Um, <laughs> um, so our golden model is this thing we call Spike. Um, uh, so I'll tell you why it's called Spike in a minute. Um, QMU, also up and running. Um, uh, we have a core gen we just released last week. This was kind of a driving deadline to get it out. So you can go grab our rocket core generator. Uh, I'll talk about rocket in a minute. We also have an educational collection of processes with the sort of talk about those. Um, so Angel. Uh, I guess Sebastian is going to steal our thunder by being much better than this, but basically you can go to our web page and boot Linux inside the browser, a uh, risk five implementation, so you can try it out. Um, our implementation only runs around two, two MIPS, so I'm looking forward to getting another factor of 10 there, using his ideas. This was done by an undergrad in a, in a few months, it's pretty, pretty impressive. Um, it's more than 10x actually. More than 10x. Yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. cool. Uh, we also have QMU, so QMU actually wants, you know, I'd recommend QMU as a development environment if you want to play with this stuff. Um, uh, it gets around 700 dry store MIPS on a kind of a silly number, but it gets about 700 dry store MIPS on a modern x86 machine. That's pretty reasonable for development work, uh, this environment. Um, so Spike is the instruction set similar. I talked about it as a factor of 10 slower. Um, so QMU use VertIO there to do all the device support. And something, so as I said, the privilege spec is still ongoing, so when that settles down, that will also be implemented in a, a QMU environment. Um, so the cores we're releasing, so you know, moving to our open source cores that we're releasing, they're written in Chisel. So Chisel's the hardware description language we came up with at Berkeley. Um, and so Chisel stands for constructing hardware in a Scala embedded language. And so Scala is a very popular, or reasonably up and coming popular language amongst web developers. It's uh, very functional, object oriented. Compiles the JVM. Uh, it's a very powerful language. It's designed actually to support embedded uh, languages, and that's why we chose it to embed a hardware description language. But what's nice here, you can write stuff that looks like HDL, but you have the full power of Scala to write generators. Um, so it's a very powerful uh, language. So you take a chisel program, you run it, and we can spit out, you know, C plus plus cycle simulator from it, or we can put out Verilog that you. Uh, can run an FPJ emulation, and we can put out Verilog that we use to do our chip designs. So from our description, we can get all these things out directly. Um, we've released this, it's all BSD open source, it's at this website, chisel.eats.berkey.edu, you can go grab it. We're working on a Chisel 3.0, which has big brown plans. Um, so the idea of Chisel 3.0 is to adopt an internal format that's um, intermediate representation, that will be standardized, exported, um, the files are back in again, so you can write Chisel code in any language, um, and we want to really, really want this to become the LLVM for hardware, if you think about it. So single representation of hardware, you can write tools that operate on these hardware representations. So what will happen is, 
our current Chisel Scala thing will just become one front end into this IR. So you should be able to come in with other front ends. Say, for example, Verilog or people using Python to write hardware or even Perl, maybe. So you can come into this chain and do stuff on this IR internally. And hopefully then people can share these transformations and passes over the hardware design, similar to the way people do with LVM. Um, so this, I think, will be very powerful. So this, the thing to realize, this is not just a hardware description language. It's also kind of a whole toolbox of doing things to hardware. Right? So it's not just Verilog. It's like Verilog plus all these other tools. Uh, but it's all written in the same language in our case. But we're going to emit uh, stuff in other languages by moving to this model. So that should come out sometime at the end of the year. But all of our cores, we write them in Chisel, we use it to build chips, we push Chisel out, our, all our cores are going to be done in Chisel. Right, how, how, does, how, how, how does Chisel compare? I mean, because there's been a very long history of trying to use other designs. Yeah. You've got System C, you've got Catapult C, you of course know all about Blue Spec, all these techniques, and they've all struggled to match what a decent RTL experienced RTL designer can achieve. Oh, so, okay, so it's not, this is not a Scala to Gates tool. So it's a hardware construction language which is different from a high level synthesis tool. So Scala, uh, sorry, Chisel has a model of, at the bottom, you just structural netlisting. So you can write exactly what you want. There's no, there's nothing between you and the Gates at the base level of Chisel. So there's absolutely zero overhead compared to Verilog. Like, absolutely none. Oh, it's right. nothing. You have complete control. But you can then layer on top and you can build in sort of behavioral like things with very clear transformations. So there's no surprises in what it does. Contrast this to System C is basically not synthesizable, but people are trying hard again now. Mm -hmm. Right? And the problem there is you have to design them with tool less to infer a microarchitecture for you, which is just beyond the state of the art, apparently. Blue spec is interesting, it has a particular computation model that encodes. And it generates schedulers. And sometimes it doesn't do what you want because it, you know, for the scheduling error, you have to figure out how to fuss with it to get it to do the right thing. It's great for writing some kinds of hardware, and it's just a pain in the neck for writing others. And also, it's not as powerful a language in which to write generators. Now, BlueSpec Classic, which was the Haskell embedded version, was, was a lot more powerful for writing generators, but hardware designers couldn't grow Haskell, <laughs> to Haskell, so they went to BlueSpec System Verilog. But the problem is that it's not a powerful language to write generators compared to us. This is a full-blown program language. You can write anything you want in this program language. BlueSpec is restricted and has this particular computation model. Right? And also, if that doesn't fit your piece of hardware design, you can't really do it. Now, we can internally play with something we call Blue Chisel, but we can give you the atomic actions for portioning design. We can give you something that does the same thing as BlueSpec, but for a piece of your design. You don't have to use that model everywhere. It just doesn't fit. Like, for example, we're doing classic processor pipelines. Synchronous five stage pipelines, blue spec gets in your way. It's not what it was designed for. It's designed for doing like more out of order or highly concurrent things. So, so I mean, it sounds what's not to like. I mean, would you, would your vision be that Chisel just replaces Verilog and System Verilog? And it doesn't replace Verilog. Verilog to us is like the assembly language that we feed into standard tools. Right, okay. So, unless, you know, Synopsys adopts Chisel as their input language, or actually more likely, we can go straight from Verbal out to there. Yeah. Things. But for now, we're doing Verilog as our assembly. We spit this out so we can be compatible with standard tools. So is there something that takes what you went and top and converts it to variable? Is that what happens? Yeah, so you spit out our chisel program. So what happens is the you can think of chisel programs in two phases. The first phase, the first phase runs all this code, elaborates your design, it comes up with an internal net list of basically combinational blocks and registers and memories. Just an RTL, flattened RTL design. Then we have different backends that crawl over that and spit out a C cycle simulator or barrel log. So if one potential problem would be the, the reason system C is struggling with the chain that would not optimize very well, you might end up in the same scenario here. No, no, the, the, no, system C, the difference with system C is you're writing C code to describe your hardware uh, behavior. We don't do that here. You write chisel code, which is much closer to Verilog. Like, the semantics are better than Verilog. Verilog. Verilog is even worse than this, because this is always synthesizable. All the chisel constructs are always synthesizable. You never this weird thing with Verilog actually. Well, actually. except for a simplified you just said that it support. You know, the Sorry? The synthesis, well, yeah, you just said the synthesis tools don't support Chisel. So no, no, but we spit out the Verilog they do support. Yeah, but I'm just saying there's some interpretation there. So where does interpretation come? No, no, the, the, the Verilog we have is very low level Verilog. Like, this, the, you know, the, the synthesis tool, I mean, actually... Yeah, but you, you don't put in Verilog at the top. I guess the point I'm making is you put something in, it gets converted to Verilog. That process of transformation you know, is, is where a lot of these languages 
Well, yeah, but it's okay. But the let, 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 let's put it this way: we're using functional programming and object-oriented programming to efficiently or pro pro productively emit registers and muxes and wires. At the end, you're 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 you know writing down muxes, registers, and combinational logic. Okay. Uh, Therefore, the rare log that you generate is synthesized. I hope it, it, it sounds good. I hope it's you know works as well as you say. Just I, I guess everyone has this idea when they start out. Yeah, but no, the, I think maybe they're not coming across as you're not. There's no magic going on these transformations. Yeah. You literally are. No, it's just it should should it's like most industrial houses, design houses, you can tell to write the rare log. That's actually what goes on these days. Kind of horrible to see, but yes, they are pearl as well. And you know, this is kind of more the equivalent to that pearl code. So, is this written in Emacs? Sorry, is it written in Emacs? Written in Emacs, Jonathan uses Emacs to code chisel. How do you mean? Uh, oh, you're saying about auto barrel log or something? You said it's it, 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 uh, I, I, I could have. No, they run, they run pearl code, they yes. have pearl generators. That's what a lot of industry guys use yeah. right now. It's a lot of hard design, it's almost entirely pearl code that spits yeah. out barrel log, it prints barrel log. <coughs> Have you compared uh, that C++ flow to using Verilator? We haven't compared the Verilator, we compared the VCS. Yes. It's about 10 times faster than VCS. <laughs> okay, because I was comparing to... I mean, by using Verilator you could cut out the whole C++ backend there and... Uh, the trouble you've got is you're generating low-level of Verilog, which will, be, which will be a nightmare for Verilator. Well, yes. the yes. point is we, yeah. we don't need... We, you don't need we it. have the data structure in memory of the whole thing. We don't have to do any parsing. We know what it is. And mm -hmm. we have, and actually we're replacing this with an LVM backend. So we're going to go straight from this IR into LVM to generate uh, efficient machine code. Uh, I'm very interested in that uh, intermediate language that you talked about. I've been thinking about the exact same thing for quite some time. But generator. having that as a subset of Verilog instead of Verilog. For the sole reason that a lot of tools support Verilog already. So if you could. But Verilog isn't very good as an intermediate language because it's much too large. But if we could define a small subset of Verilog to use an intermediate language, I think that would be a good fit because we can use we can write new tools that only need to implement that subset, and we can reuse all the old tools. Yeah, so I mean that's what we're trying to do. So this thing is called Fertil, F I R R T L. But but is that is it uh, Verilog? Oh, it's it's an internal <laughs> data structure. Well, it has a in-memory representation in a type of programming language. Currently only Scala, but you could do that for C or any other language you want to write the transformations in. Then it has a, a file format, so you can spit out the IR, you can sequentialize it to file, read it into some tool. So basically you need to provide, if you can... Yeah, bridge from the, the yeah. IR to the very long The idea is you can come in and add any language to, you know, use your favorite language to write the tool that you want. The fact there are other transformational tools gives you a cross-verification of that, but it's not particular. Right. I mean, you could turn the very later to turn them over to see if, they can see if the two behave the same, mm -hmm. and that would check whether your transformers up there are correct, mm -hmm. uh, which we have maybe a useful thing to do. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, but I mean, basically, you know, this is kind of we've built a later in here, if you like, yeah. uh, but without having to do any parsing, right? It's just we have the internal format of the thing that's just built right in there. And also, this is how we optimize the, the, the actual code that gets spit out. And also, we, have, we are working now on. Um, uh, part of the reason to go with the LVM, uh, to replace this part with LVM, is we're working on uh, auto parallelization of this. So we actually get parallelized C simulators, we can use them, like multiple machines to run it faster. Um, so that's kind of work in progress. Just one more question. Why did you choose like a functional programming language? Like, everybody here knows like, C based, whatever, regular programming languages. So you said before that it's easy for the hardware developer actually to get started. I don't know many hardware developers that have seen a functional language before. Well, it's, so, it's, well what brought you to this design decision? No, well, so Scala is not as um, alien as Haskell. It's, it's, it's not purely functional. It is, you can do it purely functional, but it's obviously going to do as well. The syntax is, it's like Java++. Plus plus. Yeah. So, you know, it's a lot better than Java. And I think you can get, there's a, a much shallower slope than Haskell <laughs> getting into this. Um, and I think the, the other point about it is, it is designed to support embedded. Languages, so we can change the syntax yeah, around. So you can write stuff that looks like an HTL. If you don't know what you do, you just write the chisel. We, we teach this so underground. So you, you can write the HTL. It looks like a HTL, and it just translates into this internal data structure. So we kind of make that slope less steep than it could be. But if you want to get the exotic stuff, it does look. It looks like line with some of the stuff Andrew writes. Right? <laughs> what the hell is this doing? And uh, but it's very powerful. Like this one line is replacing you know, several hundred lines of Verilog generator. But you can do that, but you don't have to. I mean, pick Scala, 
part of the reason we picked this, it does a lot of type inference. So the great thing over like we're all other designs, you don't have to put types in all the individual module nodes. It gets inferred and but statically checked. And we do things like bit inference. Again, it's all inferred and statically checked. So you know that it's not going to be dangling wires, but you don't have to actually change the types everywhere, all up and down the module hierarchy as you have things. Um, or when you're writing generator, it's particularly important because you don't have the types of the things while you're writing a generator. So you can make them very uh, uh, type independent modules you're writing. Right. But there is an issue, like our designers, if they're just harder, but you know, frankly, those guys, if they don't move along, they, you know, this is the future, you know, more productive programming languages, you know, working in the 1950s style programming languages are the harder guy. You know, you're getting replaced by the guy who does 10 times as much stuff as you because they're using better language, right? So, you know, sorry guys, you have to move on. <laughs> on and up and move on. Sorry, Chris, just quickly, uh, it's, it's five o'clock now. Um, yeah, I'm worried about the time. Well, I might give you 15 more minutes, is that all right, Alex? And then we'll kind of go up until six then, I guess. Well, sorry, with your talk up until six and then have a bit of a break, so. Have a break in between, maybe. Anyway, 15 more minutes. Okay. Um, Okay, so we've released a bunch of RISC V cores. We actually use Chisel in teaching. Uh, we built Chisel cores. Um, and this lets students in the undergrad architecture class actually get the RTL and play with the cores. So we've released this. Uh, we call these SODORs. So we have a train naming theme in the, the project. So processes are named after locomotives. Um, and the reason is that the very first RISC V core we built was uh, in a 28 nanometer process that was bleeding edge, such, such that it didn't actually work. And the process files, the files didn't work. And we got the little files like very close to tape out. And so that project got codenamed Trainwreck. And so we decided next time around we get better. And the next call we called it Rocket after George Stevenson's Rocket. So that was the first, you know, steam engine wasn't particularly innovative in any piece. They just pulled good things together and actually worked. So that's the plan for Rocket. That's why it's called Rocket. Sodor, if you know, is like the island that Thomas the Tank Engine and his friends live on. And this is the educational set of processors. There's a one, two, four, sorry, one, two, five stage pipeline. Um, there's a bus based microcoding machine that used to teach people microcoding. What's cool here is that inside the Chisel description is where we actually built the microcode compiler. So you can write new microcode and compile it into the microcode and then run it. So students can see how to write microcode. Um, so, okay, we actually did all this stuff because we do research in various other things, and the cores are just a piece of what we do. Um, so here is um, some fabricated silicon. We do a lot of chip fabs. Um, uh, this project is, this series of chips are all for a silicon photonics project. We're using a light to signal between chips. And we're doing this in a conventional CMOS process. We don't even tell the foundry. We're adding photonics to that process. Um, this is IBM 45 nanometer SOI, uh, these technologies. We've done five tape outs in this technology, um, EOS 14 through EOS 22. Uh, we're doing another one in November, EOS 24. These are really exciting names. Uh, I should have better names this. But, um, so this version we have back and running, so I'll just, this is the latest one that's up and running that's come back. Um, this is a dual core design, uh, built from a generator, uh, multi-BT, runs Linux, boots on Linux. Um, so this thing runs at about 1.65 gigahertz um, at uh, 1.2 volts. 1.1 volt, yeah. And it'll go down to about 500 megahertz at 0.65 volts. Um, Pretty efficient and uh, runs about. So little, this particular project, another project is interested in sort of falling point performance, uh, improving energy efficiency. Of that so this gets about up to 15, 16 gigaflops per watt, running a matrix multiply kernel, uh, double precision, you know, IEEE compliant. Uh, so actually running the code and measuring the core and cache, running that code at 16 gigaflops per watt. This is what's on the chip. So this is actually a, uh, a photograph of the chip. But this is basically a dual core system, dual core cache coherent. Each core, there's a rocket scalar core, then there's a watcher vector unit. You know, it's supposed to be building this uh, vector unit. This is a 64-bit um, floating point uh, vector unit on there. Uh, primary caches, they kept coherent. And these are the photonic links going down here, the die photo. These are, these are actually the two RISC V cores here, which are vector units, the dual core here. This stuff is one megabyte of SRAM. This stuff is all the various photonic links we're experimenting with. Uh, trying to get those to go, uh, trying to get those to work. There's many different variants on there. That's why there's so many of them. Uh, it's just still experimental. So, you know, basically this project's all about silicon photonics. These guys needed a traffic generator. We thought we can provide you a traffic generator. Processor cores gives an opportunity to tape out. And by doing these iterations, we've been tuning this core design quite a lot. So it's got substantially uh, faster and less, uh, more energy efficient as it iterated. And we, you know, do tape outs every few months uh, in this project. You can't, you can't do gigaflops, does it? 
include fused multiply, add, and vector operations? Uh, multiply is a flop and add is a flop. So mod add is two flops. Yeah. Okay, um, so yeah, the next version of Ember, so you may have heard about this other project then called Firebox, which is about data center scale designs. Uh, there we're going to be looking at uh, pyritics optical photonic switches using this technology. So in November we should have the first um, tape out of a uh, photonic switch. Uh, on that. Uh, okay, so another line of work is uh, the Raven projects, and these are more about low voltage um, uh, mobile kind of processes. Uh, I mean, particularly interested in how to run at very low voltages and keeping the SRAMs working, other components working, also increasing supply, power supply efficiency. So these guys have actually have integrated on the chip switch cap DC DC converters uh, to generate different voltages in different parts of the chip. Um, the cool design here is that instead of regulating the power supply, we let it ripple. So normally a switch cap converter, you just look at the output of the converter, it's got kind of a sawtooth waveform, you charge it up, and the load discharges it, you charge it up again. Uh, normally you want to regulate that to have a nice stable power supply. It actually turns out to be inefficient. So instead of doing that, we actually modulate the clock frequency to track the instantaneous voltage. So you run as fast as the voltage lets you run right now. And that actually helps a lot with energy efficiency. Um, so here you see kind of the voltage drops and the clock gets longer. Um, so instead of regulating, you would just cut this at the minimum here, like that. But instead of doing that, we actually make use of the excess voltage to go faster. So you better efficiency. Um, just quickly skip through some of this. This is a die photo. The core is in here. This is again a rocket core with a logic vector core. The DC DC stuff is over here. Uh, what's amazing is it actually works. Um, so Boost Linux. So it's in 28 nanometer FDUSY from ST. Um, it runs up to close to a gigahertz. This one we didn't optimize for performance of power. You know, just point tuning for that. You can actually see these are the measurements of the you can see the power supply of what it's doing. Down to runs down to about 0.45 volts. And this one actually can get up to about 30 gigafolds of what running that same kind of you know, DGM, double precision, IEEE stuff. So that's a very competitive one. Um, we're doing a, uh, a little spin of this to have more back bias control. It's FDUSOI, so you can actually drive the substrate and control the transistor threshold from the back. So we're doing that, um, taking that out next month, this month, November, next month. The next year we do a quad core version of this where every core have its own uh, DC DC converter. Uh, I mean, have you got, I mean, those sort of flops per core are phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, 50, uh, you know, 50 giga flops per floor is the, per core is the sort of long distance holy grail. And are the HPC guys beating your doors down to get their hands on the silicon? Yeah. Yeah, good, I think. Yeah, so we have a lot of people, I mean, funded by the feds and a lot of the people they find out. Actually, they're, they're an example of a customer that doesn't fit arms business model. So, um, the, if I look at all the different three letter acronyms in the US government, you have the DOE, Department of Energy, that, builds, that buys the supercomputers, like climate modeling guys. You have the DOD, who builds all the defense systems. You have the NSA, um, NASA, because it's a four letter acronym. All these guys, they need chips, they need custom processing, and the COX stuff doesn't work for them. And so there's this gap. And they're actually very interested in RISC V because they can't license cores from ARM because they. Um, well, two reasons. One, they're worried about them, and the one is that uh, I'm wanting to negotiate because, like NASA, you know, we need four cores to put in space. You know, that's the kind of market like, you've already seen that the other open cores. You know, it's not a high volume application exactly, right? So I'm certainly interested. Right, so. so, if the compiler selects lower power instruction sequences, does it mean that the voltage goes up and then the frequency goes up and the computation gets faster? Yeah, if you if you use less. Um, you use less energy per cycle, the voltage will droop slower, and you'll stay at the high voltage for longer. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually give this talk at Cambridge on uh, Thursday, and uh, Ross Anderson was there, he was saying that this might be actually very good for breaking the power security stuff because it's very asynchronous. The voltage is, the clock and the voltage are both, um, you know, wobbling around in a way. Maybe very hard actually to figure out what the process is doing. Maybe hard or easy, I don't, we don't know. So he's interested in the power analysis of this thing. Um, Anyway, so Rocket have released what's on there. So the version we released is a single issue, single issue in order of classic risk pipeline. Dual issue will come out soon. Um, it's actually designed for a dual issue design point. It's kind of a bit over designed just for single issue. It's a fully pipelined um, FPU. Then it supports Linux. There's a non blocking data cache that supports many outstanding misses. This is to help with the vector unit streaming through there. As VDD, VHD, a return address stack, branch prediction, uh, core processor interface, actually a standard interface for having your accelerator on the side. 
Um, it's a similar design point, but on A5, A7. Uh, this is a parameterized generator, so you can go over and take the code and you can just generate different variants uh, of this right now. Um, so we did a comparison against the ARM board. People kept asking us, how do you compare against the ARM? We threw these together very quickly. Um, so we took their published numbers for this process technology. Turns out we had access to the same process technology they did, so we could do a equivalent layout. Um, basically, we're faster um, per clock cycle. We are about half the area. Um, we're about half the power. Um, and we're 64 bit instead of 32 bit. Right? Um, you know, there's some differences in what we include. They have some extra debugging stuff in here, and they have to support all their ISA junk. Um, we have um, like the full atomics and hardware page table walk and all kinds of stuff in here that doesn't actually have price them. This is just price them numbers, so we shouldn't worry about it too much. But it's very competitive for compared to the ARM cores. Um, we're not just doing single issue cores. This is a project I'm going to develop that water machine called Boom, virtually out of water machine. Um, this is kind of mostly working. It's really hard actually to make an out of water core that actually goes faster than the order core. You have to get a lot of things right at the same time. So you don't get crippled by one bottleneck. So this thing has branch prediction, load store, reordering, um, unblocking data cache. And we expect this to be pretty competitive, like less than 30 ever for uh, kind of design. It's about 8,000 lines of code and chisel for the outer water core. So and this is parameterized, you can change the width and things on it. Um, so then users, um, you, you guys you hear about low risk next next. Blue spec has a core they've implemented uh, for their customers, actually. And they, it's great they've been contributing back to us um, GCC ports for the soft load API and also GDB. Um, and the big one is the Indian government has decided RISC-5 is their standard ISA. Um, so they require that all their federal contact practice and how they use uh, RISC-5 ISA. They've been developing a whole line of cores. I find this a little bit incredible. I don't know how they're going to pull this off, but they, their motivation is they want to kickstart the semiconductor industry. The Indian government is worried about the rising um, the amount of imports that are due to semiconductor components as a fraction of GDP, that percentage is rising. They want to try and kickstart their own semiconductor industry. And so they're buying fabs, all fabs, and they're uh, wanting to kickstart the local design teams and have their own cores to use. Uh, and also, they don't trust ARM in their uh, defense kind of system. Um, you're all invited to the first RISC 5 workshop. Um, we're holding this thing. Part of what we're trying to do over the next few months is try and set up a RISC 5 foundation to manage the ISA. Um, so it's not just a Berkeley thing, lots of other people, there's a, um, so basically it's free to, if you're an academic, it's free, or if you're one of the sponsors of our lab, it's free, 99 bucks for everybody else, just to cover the food, if you're asking nicely, I'll probably let you in for free, just to tell me, and you, you guys are here, I know you guys are working on this stuff, so just send me an email if you want to come, I don't want to pay 100 bucks, um, it's filling up fast actually, and I think if you should go there, you'd be quite surprised at the people that are coming. For example, we have Dick Sykes, who's an architect of the Alpha. We have um, Peter Shu, who did the MIPS RAK. Some very prominent uh, computer architects have come along. Uh, a bunch of companies, Google, Huawei, uh, Oracle. A lot of companies are going to be there. It's going to be quite, uh, should be quite interesting what shows happens there. So one thing is, this is just one of the, RISC-5 is one of the projects we're doing on that. We call out for the, all the Spire Lab project. This is actually our design map of what, what goes on in our lab. Um, there's about 11 faculty and about 50 to 60 graduate students uh, working together. Only about a handful do the RISC 5 stuff. A bunch of the others actually use it. I mean, actually, they all work together. So the stack all comes together from all these different folks people doing applications, algorithms, uh, building compiler uh, tool chains, um, building other kinds of stuff, building chisel. So this is a very big effort. This is one piece of a very big effort. Um, these are people paying for it all. Okay, that's it. How did you come with the name and it's provided? Oh, oh, um, so, Dave was always, he felt that they made a mistake after risk one and risk two. They called the next one was uh, source, we'll talk on a risk, and then after that there was first symbolic processing using risk. He felt that they lost the brand name then, so we decided to resurrect it and posthumously name Saw, risk three, and spur, risk four. So this is now risk five. Mm -hmm. so. so do you think that the architecture would live forever? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 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 well, at least I'm not going to change again. So, yeah. so. <laughs> so forever from my perspective. <coughs> so we have to see how uh, how gravity results and how humans works out. 
Yeah. Sorry. How, how, how long human longevity improves, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think my beer drinking probably means I won't last that long. So.